With the end of the first leg of the Eras tour, I think it's safe to say that Taylor Swift is a pop culture powerhouse. After almost two decades of creating and performing music, Taylor Swift has connected to the world with her storytelling, stage presence, and of course, fashion. So it might not come as a total surprise to learn that at one point, she had her very own fashion doll line. Move over, Barbie and Bratz, Taylor Swift is coming for you. If we haven't already met before, hello, my name is Mary, and I am a huge fan of dolls as well as Taylor Swift. So when I learned about this doll line, I was instantly curious, and because I no longer had waiting for my era's tour show, the ones in Seattle, to fill the Taylor Swift shaped void in my heart, I had to learn more. So in this video, we will investigate the origins of the Taylor Swift doll line, the fashion looks that inspired the doll's fashions, and we'll also look into the possibilities around why it wasn't very successful. I bought this candle a few years ago, and I haven't <laughs> ever burned it, so I feel like now is the time. It's, it's so floral. Let's make my home Taylor Swift scented. Yeah, that's great. On March 11, 2008, Jax Pacific announced a deal between themselves and Creative Arts Agency, which was the talent agency that worked with Taylor at the time. This deal was to launch a line of toys, including fashion dolls, wearing Swift's fashions, arts and crafts kits, and roleplay toys. Jennifer Richmond, a Jax spokesperson, said, Tweens have developed a great connection with Taylor Swift, resulting in an aspirational following that not only enables girls to emulate this beautiful young country star, but encourages them to believe in themselves. Considering Taylor had really reached out to and connected with what had mostly been an untapped market of young women and girls in the country scene, this makes sense. There were probably a vast number of young women and girls watching Taylor's rise and essentially would want to play along or dream out that for themselves as well. In the Jack Specific news release for this, Taylor's quoted as saying, When I was a little girl, I dreamed of becoming a country music star and having my very own fashion doll line. Now it's come true. I can't wait to see little girls play with my doll and rock out with my crystal guitar. Which is definitely totally a real quote and something a real human would say. From what I've been able to gather, at least the first wave of dolls were designed by Dynamic Design Works Inc. This company would design and develop toys for a number of different brands, including some notable lines such as Once Upon a Zombie and Konichiwa Babies, but also working with some more popular brands such as Cabbage Patch Kids. I was able to find some of the prototypes and reference imagery that this company used when designing and developing the Taylor Swift doll line. It is very 2008, graphic design is my passion core. Like there there's just so much happening in these images. This does kind of fit with the energy of the debut CD itself, having kind of like the overlay floral butterfly graphics that it does have. I found the inclusion of the tattoo imagery pretty interesting, seeing that Taylor has always kind of had this good girl image, and even within the past couple of years has spoken openly about how she's never planned on getting a tattoo. Ugh, I don't want, I don't, I don't want to get a tattoo. It turns out though, there was a point in her life when she was actively drawing a heart onto her foot with a sharpie and apparently really wanted to get that tattooed, but her dad was super against it. This was still at the point where she very much was a good girl in the media. Like she wasn't even wearing her iconic red lipstick yet because her team thought it would make her look too mature. I think part of why this branding was included was not only Taylor wanting this heart tattoo herself, but also that Ed Hardy was so popular at this time. Ed Hardy was at like the peak of its popularity in 2008. So I think they were just trying to capture a little little bit of that energy as well and kind of appealing to younger kids that are into this cool, hip, Ed Hardy vibe that's going on right now. There's also a bit more pink here than I would like personally associate with Taylor. In my mind, she's like a blue green girl. So I think this is possibly just trying to, you know, reach out to girls being like, ooh, it's pink, it's girly, it's cute, without it necessarily matching like Taylor's brand. <laughs> While researching, I was actually able to find the Instagram accounts for one of the people that worked on designing this doll line. In an Instagram post about the doll line, she wrote that the dolls were originally created and pitched by the company to Jack's Pacific. 
The dolls were then developed at Jack Pacific by an in-house designer. She also notes that a lot of the designs and assets that were used for the Taylor Swift doll line were actually taken from designs that she created for Jack Pacific just the year prior for the Hannah Montana doll line. So with the dolls developed and designed, we're ready to check out what they looked like at release. In October of 2008, the first wave of the Taylor Swift doll line was released. Based off of my research and the prototypes I found, I believe that the first wave consisted of the following dolls. Two of the performance-ready singing dolls, Our Song and Teardrops on My Guitar, both of which retailed for $19.99, and then three of the fashion collection dolls, including Red Carpet Ready, Sundress Medley, and Pretty in Pink, all of which retailed for $14.99. Something you may notice if you look up the dolls themselves or as you're watching this video is that the doll's packaging changes. The same doll will have multiple different styles of packaging. This is actually because for some reason, with each wave of the dolls that was released, there were three in total, they did a complete redesign of the packaging. So even if they released the same doll again, say the Teardrops on My Guitar doll, they released it with a complete new packaging design. I personally would like to refer to these as you have to start somewhere, fun and cute clamshell, and then ugly. When I was researching, I really originally thought that this blue packaging was the first one that came out because in my opinion, it's the significantly worse <laughs> option of the three. We'll cover that more when we get to it, but I just wanted to let you know why you might see different packaging styles. The first wave had this you have to start somewhere packaging, which isn't bad, but also isn't amazing. Kind of just gets the point across. I do however think that this is the most rare packaging. None of the dolls beyond the ones released in 2008, so for those two months, used this packaging. So we can assume that it's the first one that was released and probably was available for the least amount of time. So now let's get into the dolls. The first dolls that we'll look at are the performance ready dolls, which were these singing dolls. I think these are the most iconic and recognizable of the Taylor Swift dolls because they are wearing outfits taken directly from her music videos. The R Song doll features Taylor in the blue ball gown dress that she wears in the video. This dress was actually designed by Sandy Spitka, as in Sandy Spitka Borchetta, the wife of the owner of Big Machine Records, which was the record label that Taylor Swift was signed to for most of her career. Sandy Spitka worked as the creative director and stylist for Big Machine Record labels. Little Sandy! It's my uh, makeup artist. Slash stylist, slash dressmaker, slash hairstylist, slash like everything. And had also already been designing clothes for artists in the country scene for over a decade. Sandy Spica has been designing Reba's clothes for over eight years. So it makes complete sense that she would be working with Taylor. This doll also came with a silver hairbrush and holographic guitar, which was likely supposed to emulate the crystal or bedazzled guitar that Taylor used in her music video. This doll is also one of the ones that we have the prototype photo of, so we can compare the two. While we can't see all of the details, it's pretty clear that the face mold completely changed, they look quite different, as well as other details like the hair color have changed. This prototype was likely completely made by Dynamic Design Works Inc. and then was reworked by a designer at Jax Pacific for the sake of creating a version that could be more easily mass produced. The other notable difference is the VIP pass. All of the doll prototypes actually came with a human sized accessory that kids were supposed to be able to use when they played along with their doll. While none of these are actually included with the dolls, they are mentioned in a bulk sale listing for the dolls. So I think maybe they originally were intended to be part of the doll but might have been a last minute change to remove them. Moving on, our next doll is the Teardrops on My Guitar doll. This doll features Taylor in a frankly gorgeous dress from the music video, this blue green teal ball gown that was also designed by Sandy Spitka and I consider to be a very iconic Taylor look. She looks so good in green, I really wish that she would wear more of it. This doll also included a hairbrush as well as a guitar. From the prototype, we can see that the doll originally kind of had these cool curling details that came off the dress, which I'm assuming probably would have been kind of hard to replicate in a mass produced setting. The doll was also originally supposed to have a necklace, which like weirdly enough, she doesn't wear a necklace in the music video. So that's kind of a funny detail. And what I believe would have been stick on jewels for kids to use on the 
themselves. Both of these singing dolls played a 30 second long clip of the song, but these songs weren't specifically edited down for the dolls themselves, like Hit Clips had, if any of you remember Hit Clips. Hit it! Coming at you right between the ears is Hit Clips. So these ones just like cut off after 30 seconds. Like, it's all you get buy the CD. Next, we have our fashion collection dolls. And the first of those is Red Carpet Ready. The style of a country music star, so chic. This doll has what I consider to be a very classic doll trope, which is the two-in-one outfit that just involves like taking off a skirt or changing a skirt. The working woman Barbie also does this. So if you haven't already seen my video on her, please be sure to check it out. It is a very good video. This doll's outfit was based off of the dress that she wore to the 41st CMA Awards, designed again by Sandy Spitka. At this award ceremony, Taylor actually won the Horizon Award, which is given to up and coming country artists and is the source of what I think is like one of the cutest young Taylor quotes. This is definitely the highlight of my senior year. <laughs> This is the highlight of my senior year. <laughs> According to the prototype, this pack was also supposed to feature an actual second outfit, which is the outfit that Taylor wore for her performance at the CMA Awards in a Diane von Furstenberg, Festenberg? sequin dress, as well as including a human charm bracelet. The next doll that we have for these fashion packs is the sundress medley, which... <laughs> is sort of what I refer to as, now that's what I call Taylor Swift's debut era. <laughs> she's a country girl. She's got her dress. She's got her boots. She's an icon. You might have noticed that on the box for this doll, as well as for many of the other ones, it includes a line that says, real Taylor Swift outfits, implying that these are based off of real outfits that she's worn. That's originally what led me down this research rabbit hole. I really wanted to figure out what exactly the doll's outfits were based off of. And let me tell you, this has been <laughs> a bit of a journey. Because Taylor has worn a lot of sundresses, but has she worn these sundresses? I don't know. Actually, I do, I do know. I do know exactly. The box art seems to want to imply that the white dress she's wearing is supposed to be based off of the white dress that she wears in the debut album cover. However, this is not the dress that she's wearing. They're actually quite different styles. The dress she's wearing, I believe, is based off of one that she wore for her 2008-2009 calendar photo shoot. This was the first calendar that she ever released, and it is hard to find photos of the inside of it. However, some outtakes from the photo shoot are available online that show her wearing this white dress, which I'm pretty sure is, you know, it's pretty similar style. And one of the photos that I was able to find of the inside of the magazine shows her wearing that white dress with her iconic pair of Liberty boots. Taking a moment for the boots, these were a custom pair of Liberty boots based off of their Peace and Love boots, where the Peace and Love was instead changed to say Taylor Swift, which I love. These are just iconic, they're adorable. And one thing to note is actually at the bottom of the box, it explicitly states that the boots were designed by Liberty Boots. That's just something to keep in mind. Then we have this floral dress, which I really struggled with for a while. For the longest time, I was looking through photos and the closest thing I could find was this floral dress that she actually wore for a Jonas Brothers music video. Uh, it's the one for Love Is On Its Way, which was part of the Jonas Brothers, the 3D concert experience movie, which like, blast to the past, haven't thought about that in a hot second. <laughs> but digging around even more, I looked at some of her concert photos from when she was touring with Brad Paisley in 2007, and I found this dress. There's not a ton of photos of her in it, but I'm pretty positive this is actually supposed to be the one that it's based off of. I couldn't find the designers for either of these dresses, unfortunately, but I kind of know at least the origin of them. Continuing on with the trend of where is this dress from? We have the Pretty in Pink doll. This may come as a slight surprise to the uninitiated, but kind of as I was saying before, Taylor doesn't wear a ton of pink. She's actually way more into neutrals, metallics, kind of black or darker colors. So them including a doll that is explicitly wearing pink is kind of surprising. But from a fashion doll toy line competing with Barbie side of things, 
it makes a little bit more sense. This fashion pack is also interesting because for each wave that was released, it's slightly different. They change out the outfits in it, which is really weird. We don't see that with any of the other dolls. In the first pack, we have this sweatshirt dress, which is black. With the second wave, that sweatshirt just changes to being a pink and white striped version of it. And then the final version I've been able to find, they actually just changed the main pink dress to be a different style. So super weird. I've never seen something like this with a fashion doll line, and this only happens with this specific pack, the pretty in pink version. The pink dress that she wears with the first two waves is actually based off of a Betsy Johnson dress that she wore for her 18th birthday party, which was featured as the music video for Beautiful Eyes, which is included on the Beautiful Eyes EP. This is a super cute dress, just like super adorable outfit in general. I am a big Betsy Johnson fan, but not big enough to be able to identify exactly what year this was from. I looked through her runways from like 1998 to 2008, and I couldn't find it in there, so I don't know if it was custom for Taylor or if it was more vintage, but it's a super cute dress and it does look very Betsy, so I do believe it's a Betsy dress. About this dress, Taylor told People Magazine, it was between this and a black dress. I knew all my friends would be in black, so I went with pink. I love pink. So again, she does love pink, she just doesn't wear a ton of it. So we know where that dress is from, but then we have this sweatshirt dress, which has kind of been driving me up a wall. I cannot, for the life of me, figure out when Taylor has worn this, either the black version or the pink and white striped version. She's worn something really similar to this black version in her reputation era, so maybe some like time travel is taking place here. But when it comes especially to this pink version, I can't find anything like it. Taylor does wear a ton of black and does wear a lot of sweatshirts. So the concept for this first pack, yeah, it makes sense. I could totally see her wearing that, but especially with the switch to the pink and white stripe, I just have no clue what this is supposed to be referencing. I'm gonna say something slightly controversial. I don't think this dress is based off of a real outfit she's worn. She's worn a black sweater dress with cowboy boots that's kind of similar, but I don't know, it just has such a specific neckline and design that I feel like it has to be from something she does own. But I have looked at almost every photo I can find of Taylor from like 2007 to 2009, so I just can't find it. If you can find it, please let me know. I would love to see it. So with that, we have reached the end of the first wave of dolls. At some point in 2009, wave two happens. I can't find the exact date that these were released, but at some point over the year 2009, we made the switch to the much cuter packaging design. And then we had two more of the performance ready dolls come out, Picture to Burn and then Love Story. I'm assuming that this is the order that they came out in because the Picture to Burn dolls box doesn't include the Love Story doll, but the Love Stories doll box does include Picture to Burn. That also lines up with when the music videos were released with Picture to Burn coming out in March of 2008 and a Love Story coming out in September of 2008. Picture to Burn is the last released doll that I have been able to find concept art of. The art is pretty well the exact same as the doll itself. So I have a feeling this doll was designed after the original line was either released or had gotten far enough in production that they had better expectations for what the dolls were going to look like. The doll is wearing a gray one shoulder dress and the thigh high leather boots as featured in the music video. These are both designed again by Sandy Spitka, who actually had to custom make these boots for Taylor because she was too tall for anything that was available on the market at the time. It also includes a brush, electric guitar, and a hat that she does wear in the music video and wears for a couple of different performances of the song as well. I have to also say Picture to Burn is just one of my favorite Taylor songs. It is so fun. It has such a great banjo part. And it's one of those songs I have really distinct memories of like scream singing along with in the car. I also appreciate that they're releasing a doll that is wearing a black outfit because again, Taylor did actually wear a lot of black. And so it's nice to kind of highlight her like edgier teen moments that she was having. Like hard edge, like check it out. Like jewelry you'd wear to beat somebody up. I'm excited. 
Then we kind of have the exact opposite of that with the Love Story doll. This doll is unique because it actually features the only updo out of any of the dolls in the line. And she is of course wearing the iconic ball gown that Sandy Spitka designed for the video. Because her hair is styled in an updo, it actually doesn't come with a hairbrush, which kind of like limits play opportunities. I don't know, in some ways it kind of makes it feel a little bit more like a figure than a doll, but at the same time, I kind of appreciate them not including a brush because then kids are probably less likely to mess up her hair and then be upset because it's probably like very specifically rooted into the doll's head to look good pulled up. And that is actually the end of our Mostly Quiet Wave 2. But do not worry, there is a lot more to come with Wave 3. On December 3rd of 2009, Jack's Pacific announced the expansion of the Taylor Swift doll line. This would include the following items, which would be released spring of 2010. Two new fashion performance dolls, two new fashion doll collection dolls, multiple Taylor Swift fashion packs, a fashion wardrobe set, and a song recording studio set. This wave is also, of course, the introduction of my least favorite packaging. All of these boxes feature just the same images of Taylor on them, and I feel like the plain purple background on them as well is a bit of a disservice and really highlights how little is included with some of these dolls. I think that the swirls and the artwork that they used on the previous packaging look a lot better and kind of give the illusion that you're getting a lot more that you're paying for than with this third wave of packaging. That being said, let's get into the dolls. Our first doll we're looking at is the You Belong With Me doll. This is what I consider to be kind of the least interesting of the performance collection dolls. It's frankly pretty visually boring. It includes Taylor wearing a white dress as featured in the end of the music video, a silver guitar, and brush. This is actually our first performance-ready doll in a dress that wasn't designed by Sandy Spitka and is instead from the brand Giovanni. The brand specializes in formal wear. This is actually a wedding dress, and Taylor would go on to actually use this dress during her Fearless tour for performances of Love Story, I believe. I think the choice to go with the white dress from the music video was the least interesting option. This music video has a lot of quite iconic looks, from the Junior Jewel shirt to the marching band uniform, even the like evil girlfriend outfit is really recognizable, so I'm sad that they didn't go for one of those looks. Or even just including maybe the Junior Jewels outfit in the pack would have been a super cool option. Those outfits felt a lot more relatable and in my opinion kind of offered a lot more play options. I can see a lot more kids going like, oh my gosh, I have those pajamas too and I match with my doll or like, oh my gosh, I'm also in band rather than just like, oh, she looks like a princess. I really think that the perfect outfit for this doll actually would have been the marching band uniform that Taylor wears during the Fearless Tour that's like torn off of her body. It's just such a cool outfit. It fits the song so well. It fits her like theatrical persona when she's touring. So I'm kind of bummed that they didn't decide to pull from any of her tour outfits for these dolls. The final performance ready doll to be released was a special edition holiday doll. In 2007, Taylor had released the Taylor Swift Holiday Collection, which was an EP of her singing some covers and some original Christmas songs. This doll sings the Santa Baby cover that's included on that EP. As far as her outfit goes, I haven't been able to find an exact match. The cover for the holiday EP actually uses a photo from her teardrops on my guitar look, so they didn't do a specific holiday themed photo shoot, but Taylor has worn a ton of red dresses. Like red is a color that looks good on her, she's worn it a lot. So I'm sure she's worn a very similar dress to this, I just couldn't find an exact match. From there, we can move on to the fashion collection dolls for this wave. The first one that we have is Night Today. This doll features two outfits, the first of which is based off of the outfit she wore for the 2009 CMT Awards when she performed You Belong With Me. This is a Rebecca Taylor dress that has been slightly customized to add some sparkle along the top. The second look, the black and white striped shirt with the jeans, is from a shoot she did with Glamour magazine in 2009. I can't pinpoint the exact designers for this look. I think it was a bit of a mix, but it's definitely from that Glamour magazine shoot. I like this doll pack. I think it's a good mix of a more casual outfit for Taylor to wear when she's out and about, as well as a more performance-focused outfit. And even though the dress is kind of plain, I think it offers some more play options. Then we have the camera ready set. 
I really like the look of this set. I think it really matches Taylor's kind of aesthetic at the time, which I think a lot of us had, which was like lightly business casual. <laughs> to all the young women in 2009 that were wearing business casual to middle school, I see you, I feel you, and I was there. <laughs> the first look is based off of an outfit Taylor wore when arriving to the Late Late Show with David Letterman in 2008. She is wearing a French Connection skirt, Nordstrom tights, and Louis Vuitton boots. The white ruffle dress is one that she wore in 2008 to host Total Request Live. This dress is designed by Lila Azar. I feel like I have a quote about this. About the dress, Taylor even said that this is one of her favorite dresses that she's ever worn because it's so pure and classic. And the designer said, I loved seeing her in this dress because it seemed like such a natural, effortless choice for her. She looked feminine, comfortable, sexy, and youthful all at the same time. This pack also included a brush as well as a purse, which is a nice detail. We love some accessorizing. Now we can get into some of the newer additions into the Taylor Swift line, which includes some accessories. The first one is this wardrobe set. Two versions of this wardrobe set actually exist. One that features just the wardrobe itself and another that features the wardrobe with a doll. I do believe the version that included the doll might be a Canadian exclusive because all of the packaging for it that I can find includes everything in both English and French, which is very typical for Canadian packaging. In fact, I think it's required, but not super typical for American packaging. Now it's totally possible they weighed one packaging style and released it anywhere. However, I do think that's pretty uncommon. Americans tend to not like other languages on their packaging. I haven't been able to find an English only version of this packaging and I also haven't been able to find any of the other packaging that had both French and English on it. So that's what leads me to believe this might have been released only in Canada. The package that just includes the dresser also has an outfit in it as well as some hangers. I believe that the pink dress in this is based off of a Joanna Barinshi heiress boho dress that she was pictured in. It is a very cute dress. I absolutely love it. The accessories from the photos I've seen and this doll aren't a perfect match, so it's totally possible Taylor wore this dress a number of times and I'm pulling the wrong photos, or they decided to just go with some more basic accessories. To be fair, this packaging does not include the real Taylor Swift outfits labeling on it, so they are technically allowed to break the rules a little bit. However, our pack with the doll does have that label on it. I'm pretty sure that this dress is based off of another candid shot, this one being from when she was in London in 2009. I believe this dress is designed by Tracy Reese. Now, I wouldn't say that these are an exact match, but the texture of the two dresses look kind of similar, as well as the colors. It's a basic blue dress, so I'm sure she's worn that a thousand times essentially, but just looking through the photos that I've seen, these are what I would say are the closest matches. Then we can get into our fashion packs. There were four fashion packs released with outfits for your Taylor Swift doll. The first two, yellow sundress and pink sundress, were both designs based off of a collaboration Taylor did with LEI. These dresses consisted of five different styles, each of which retailed for $14 and were available at Walmart. I sort of miss the time when celebrities had really affordable clothing lines in stores. There was something really fun as a kid of being able to wear these clothes that your favorite celebrity had designed or played a part in or was just actively profiting off of, I don't know. But I thought that that was really cool as a kid and I kind of miss that today. The third pack is magazine cover, which features Taylor in this vested gold Look. Another source that I found online listed as this specifically being from a Blender magazine shoot, which she does wear a vest and white shirt for, and that is the cover shot, but she's also wearing leather pants in it, and there's not a lot of gold going on. So based off of its name being magazine cover, I think that this is probably the outfit that inspired it and obviously isn't an exact match. And then there's the Dance in the Rain set. Where is this from? <laughs> I'm sorry. I have been researching for this video for almost three weeks. I have looked through so many photos of Taylor from 2007 to 2009, and I cannot find anything <laughs> like this dress. It just looks so different from what she was wearing at the time. This blue Rebecca Taylor dress kind of has a similar vibe in that it is blue and has a bow on it, but it's obviously 
not the same. I feel just so confused and tired by this. This is such a specific outfit and a specific look and my brain just cannot identify where it's supposed to be from. If any of you do know where this is from, please let me know because again, I feel slightly feral trying to identify where this look is from. The last thing that released with this wave was the song recording set, which was essentially an accessory pack that included headphones, a chair, a microphone, a photo of Taylor, and a drink. So you could kind of play along that she was recording a song in her recording studio. Oh, you didn't think that that was everything, did you? You see, at some point in the later half of 2010, the final dolls for the Taylor Swift line would be released. For the longest time, I didn't even think that some of these had been officially released because I couldn't find any information about the releases online. But I found them enough in online auctions that they must have been available somewhere. The theme of this half wave, I would say, is reduce, reuse, recycle. And I think it was also a bit of a last push to make this line work. You know that time I was like, wow, I really don't think that this is based off of a dress that Taylor wore. Well, don't worry, because they just used it again. This jukebox pack is a really weird pack. It includes the doll of Taylor wearing the sweater dress that haunts my dreams, a Taylor magazine, records, a microphone, and a light up jukebox that plays picture to burn and love story. It's a fun concept, but I've personally never seen Taylor Swift with a jukebox before, so it is kind of a weird accessory to include with her, because as far as I can remember, it really doesn't have anything to do with her brand. Slightly more relevant to her, we have the making a video set. You know that other time that I was like, oh, I don't think this dress is based off of one that Taylor actually wore? Well, don't worry, they also used that dress again. <laughs> I feel like I must be wrong about these not being based off of dresses she really wore, considering that they keep using them, but again, I can't find <laughs> what they're supposed to be referencing. I feel like this is a little bit more on brand for her, and I think it would be fun for kids to get to play with this and pretend to create Taylor Swift's music videos, because I think for a lot of kids, that's the way that they mostly see Taylor Swift, actually, is probably in her music videos. I just kind of wish that the outfit she was wearing is actually from one of her music videos. I feel like that would make a little bit more sense. The set included the doll as well as a light up vanity and a camera. Then we have the decorate your own fashion doll set, which just really rolls off the tongue. This I think is the only arts and crafts related item that Jack Pacific would release with the Taylor Swift line. It features Taylor again in a repeat outfit, this white ruffle dress, as well as with a plain t-shirt and jeans that you can decorate using rhinestones and glitter glue included with the set. I feel like it would have been kind of cute for them to lean into the Junior Jewels vibe with this set, maybe include some markers, so it's a little bit of a bummer that they went more in the glittery direction. I totally understand though, as a glitter fan. It does, however, end up kind of just feeling like you had extra parts and threw them together to make a set. I actually found someone on Macari selling a sample of this doll, and so I reached out to them about it because I was curious. They never replied, which is totally fine, but from the sound of it, it sounds like Taylor and their team might have sent samples of some of the dolls to fans. This is kind of cool because I wasn't 100% sure how involved Taylor and her team were in the process of this doll creation, and so I think this kind of implies that they were involved, but again, can't say for sure how hands-on anything was. Then we have the final dolls released, which are also just just sad. <laughs> These are budget dolls, which is really normal for any doll line, but man, they just don't look so cute. The line is called the Melody Doll Set. It includes Taylor in three different dress colors of that Betsy Johnson dress from the Pretty in Pink doll set. These also included a guitar with them. These dolls also have the real Taylor Swift fashion label on them, which I'm gonna call BS on because Taylor has not, as far as I can tell, worn these dresses in any color other than pink. So the blue and the purple one are lies. I know you're lies, Jack Pacific, okay? These dolls don't come with brushes and they're quite obviously designed to be a budget option and they definitely look it. 
Before we get into the gritty details of why I think this doll line didn't quite work, I did want to cover the two unreleased items that we have evidence of. The first is the LEI Jean Collaboration doll. This is based off of the 2008 photo shoot that Taylor did with LEI jeans. This doll looks incredibly detailed and really, really closely matches the look from the photo shoot. It was labeled as being a Walmart exclusive, which would make sense seeing it seems that LEI products perhaps were exclusively sold through Walmart at the time, or at least Taylor's dress line also was. I do think that it is quite a bummer this one was never released because I think this is without a doubt, one of the best looking of the dolls in terms of the amount of detail that went into it. Like, I personally don't love the outfit, but it's very of its time, and again, it looks really accurate to the photo shoot itself. The second item was actually a tour bus. This looks so over the top and cute. I love all of the little accessories. It has like a jacuzzi. It has a bed on the top that like pops up. It's got a vanity for her. It has artwork of herself everywhere, which I think is so funny to imagine someone just decorating their home only with photos of themselves, like not photos with friends. It's my portrait gallery of me. It also includes a treadmill, which at first I was like, man, these poor young women have so much pressure on them to look a specific way. But then it turns out Taylor actually did have a treadmill on her tour bus. So that's actually just alarmingly accurate. <laughs> It is really hard to make a fashion doll centered around one real human. Barbie works because Barbie can wear anything. Barbie can look like anyone. She doesn't have to wear clothing that really exists and has been designed for humans. Taylor Swift, on the other hand, is a real human who wears normal human clothing. Is that clothing fashionable? Yes, for sure, but has it been designed to look good as a doll? No. You might remember at the start of the video, I mentioned that one of the designers that worked on this line had previously worked on the Hannah Montana doll line that was also produced by Jack Pacific. Comparing these two is kind of wild because they were designed by similar teams, released at the same time, and were both about teenage musicians, but they look very different. The Hannah dolls tend to have a lot more detail. They have custom printed fabrics, belts and scarves, a lot of different layers and textures of fabric. And why is it that these outfits look so different? It's because Hannah's wearing costumes and Taylor isn't. Hannah Montana dolls work because she isn't wearing what normal humans would wear on a day-to-day -day basis. The looks are recognizable, fun, and appealing for kids. And they work in doll form essentially because they were designed to. Disney created Hannah Montana to appeal to kids and explicitly to be marketable. Taylor Swift, on the other hand, isn't being styled to specifically appeal to kids or to be making merchandise out of her image in that way. Like I said before, I do think the performance-ready dolls from this line are the ones that work the best because she's wearing those iconic outfits we've seen from her music videos, essentially because she's wearing costumes. You know when and why she was wearing them. I'm not sure kids, aside from super fans, would have known about or cared about the origins of these outfits that she wore, which kind of then makes the whole real Taylor Swift outfits appeal pointless. Like, who cares if she's really worn this outfit if it's boring? So while as a fan of Taylor Swift, I love this concept, I just don't think it works for a toy line. And speaking of Hannah Montana again, these dolls were in direct competition with each other. They would have been sold at the same places at the same time, probably for around the same cost. They both had similar gimmicks, both of them having the singing dolls and the just regular dolls. And I feel like a lot of child fans of Taylor Swift probably were also fans of Hannah Montana. And so they would have to choose between these two dolls that kind of already look similar, but Hannah's outfits were a lot more fun and recognizable. It also doesn't help that the Taylor Swift line was also using assets that were created for the Hannah Montana line. For example, both of them had this making a music video set that uses the same pieces, but Hannah's set had more stuff in it. 
The unreleased Taylor Swift tour bus was just a redesign of the actually released Hannah Montana one. And Hannah even had multiple sets featuring this same light up jukebox. Except for Hannah, it makes sense because she had a jukebox in her room in the show. Because we as consumers have seen her room and we see the places that she interacts with, we see her life, it's much easier to buy these things because they have that kind of level of being recognizable. For Taylor, we don't see every aspect of her life in the same way that we do for a character on a TV show. And of course, Taylor being just one person versus like the cast of a show means that we only get Taylor dolls. But for say the Hannah Montana line, we get dolls of Hannah, we get Miley dolls, we get dolls of her friends or romantic questionables, what are they called? Of course, I have no like specific statistical proof that the doll line didn't do well. But the fact that it ended is usually a sign that stuff isn't selling so well, and the fact that it ended with so many of the final released dolls essentially being repackaged versions of previous ones or items from other doll lines doesn't really show that a lot of time or money was being put towards the development and the design of the dolls at the end of the line, which again kind of implies that it's probably not doing too well financially. Another challenging element of this and designing for the dolls themselves is the fact that Taylor was wearing designer clothes a lot of the time. Now, I'm of course no lawyer, but I did take the LSAT twice, which means I have no clue, frankly, what I'm talking about. You might remember me mentioning earlier with the Sundress Melody doll boxes that on the bottom of them, they explicitly labeled the boots as being designed by Liberty Boots Company. They wouldn't do that for any other article of clothing in these boxes, despite the fact that we found what they are based on. For the dresses designed by Sandy Spitka, I can understand. She was an internal part of the Taylor Swift team and thus probably was happy to say, yeah, you know, make these dolls based off of these designs I made. But when it comes to outfits designed by other people, I'm assuming it gets a lot more complicated. And for the doll line, they would have to make them different enough that it wouldn't cause any sort of legal issues with the designers. So I feel like that probably made a lot of restrictions around what Jack Pacific could actually make or design without facing possible legal issues from the actual designers of these clothes. I didn't know where to put this piece of information, so I'm gonna throw it in here now. One month after Taylor's talent agency signed the agreement with Jack Pacific to make these dolls in 2008, Taylor switched talent agencies. Because the agreement was through the talent agency, I have no clue if that affected the way things were going with the doll line. Obviously, the doll line was still released, but I have no idea if that possibly kind of changed the plan for things. So that's just another little thing to keep in mind. One last thing that I want to note is it seems in general at this time, possibly due to the 2008 recession, that the quality on these toys wasn't the best. Miley? When I was researching for this video, I felt pretty convinced I was never going to get one of the dolls. They're simply too expensive online right now. Most of them baseline are over $100, and the performance ready dolls, which I like, can go for significantly more, up to like $400. And I'm personally just like not super interested in paying that. <laughs> However, one of my friends, Anima, who knows I'm a fan of Taylor and love dolls, actually sent me somebody's Instagram story where they were showing the Taylor Swift doll in a toy store. The price on the box looked like it only said $100, so I said, fuck it. And I messaged the toy store and they were actually able to ship it to me. They didn't add any cost on for shipping, so I only paid $100 plus tax. So let's open up my Taylor Swift doll. She's packaged really delightfully in this flip soccer box. I'm a little scared when it comes to opening up a secondhand toy. There's always a possibility that like something went wrong in shipping. Oh, I... I do have my blade. Do, 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 do. Oh my god, it's a large, a large doll. Wow! 
below. Can you all guess what one I got? Put it in the comments. Guess before I before I reveal. Oh my god. We're so excited. She looks so pretty. Oh my god. So yeah, I got the second wave performance ready teardrops on my guitar doll. Oh yeah, she just has like a little little button right on her stomach. It's like her belly button that you're pressing. Her battery is dead. The person at the store when I had contacted them was like, hey, just so you know, battery's dead. I was like, that's totally fine. I wanna keep her in package. I'm not super concerned about her being able to sing. But again, I think this packaging is just like really gorgeous. It's really pretty for a doll. Oh, it does look like her hairbrush has fallen down, but that's fine. I don't really care about that. The guitar is still there. The doll is still there. The doll looks so cute. I like, <laughs> I like how they did the bodice with the ribbons. It's really cute. It like matches the actual style of the dress super well. Of course, we also have the back of it with this very large picture of her. And I'm just checking at the bottom. Again, we don't have any outfit credits. This is just like a very cool find and I'm very excited to have her in my home and in my collection. Now I gotta figure out where I'm gonna put her. Cause I got, I got a lot of dolls. But yeah, you'll see her in the background of my future videos. And so that ends our Taylor Swift doll adventure. Thank you all so much for coming with me as we frankly dove into the Taylor Swift cinematic universe today and investigated this doll line. If you have any more information about the dolls or any memories from your own childhood, please feel free to share them. I would love to hear more. There's only so much that you can find from aimlessly Googling for three weeks. This video was a lot of fun for me to research though, and I hope it was enjoyable to watch. If you wanna see some more deep dive videos, I do a series on video games called thrift games as well as I've done a couple of other ones based off of dolls. I recommend checking out my angelic layer dolls video. I really loved making it and it's another fun one. In the comments down below if you haven't already commented somehow please do so and tell me your favorite Taylor Swift song. I am always very curious as well as perhaps what doll was your favorite. I'm curious about that as well. I would say my favorite doll of course is our teardrops on our guitar girly here. But I do think at this time, my favorite Swift song is probably Gold Rush. It just hits. It just hits. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give it a like. Please subscribe if you would like to see more and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.